and welcome to our online service here at Hope City KL. We're so glad that you're able to join us today for our service and we've got an amazing lineup for you today. We've, we'll be hearing from Pastor Joel, our lead pastor, and we're continuing our Disciple series this month. Now, right before we head on to a time of worship, if any of you have called Jesus your savior, but you have never been water baptized, can I encourage you to take this step of faith because in the month of April on Easter Sunday, we're going to be doing water baptisms in person. And so if that's you, you have not been water baptized and you would love to take this step of faith, there'll be more details coming up in the service later and you can sign up for it. Right now, we're going to head on to a time of worship. So why don't you join us in lifting the name of Jesus today?
Supporting the vision of Hope City financially helps us in our endeavor to reach people across our city and beyond. Whether it's through your monthly tithe or a generous gift, you're enabling our church to create opportunities for many to hear about the truth and love of Jesus. For those with Maybank accounts, you can scan this QR code, enter the amount, and a reference such as Offering or VB for Vision Builders. For other banks, use these details to make a transfer or to deposit cash at your local public bank. Why not save these bank details as a favourite on your banking app to make giving even easier in the future? For those who prefer, PayPal is another simple option. Our PayPal account is registered to hopecitykl at gmail.com. If you need a receipt for your giving, you can email finance at hopecity.my. Our prayer is that God would use your giving miraculously through our church and that you'd see His hand of provision over your life too. Thank you for your generosity. Well, hey everyone, good to have you here today. My name is Joel, and along with my wife, Emma, we're the lead pastors of Hope City KL, uh, which is our church in the great city of Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So we're so glad that you've joined us today. We're actually on part three of a series called Disciple. Uh, over this series, it's been amazing as we've been looking at what it truly means, the definition when Jesus said, come and be my disciple, what that actually means. I think for so many of us today, being a Christian just means that we believe the right things, that we attend church, and that occasionally, you know, we try and do the right thing. Uh, but Jesus' original invitation was to come and be my disciple. That's so much more beautiful and captivating and intense in a way. He didn't call us to simple church attendance, but he called us to pick up our cross and to follow him into life. And so we're learning what it means to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus and then to learn to do what he did. And so we're going to spend these next two weeks talking about being with Jesus. And I am going to read you probably my favorite passage of scripture in the New Testament. If it's right to have favorites, I'm going to read it to you right now. It's in John 15 and we're going to read uh, eight verses together. So turn there with me today. Jesus says these words, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. And if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, the mood is tense as Jesus is sitting with his disciples the night before he dies. And there's dread and fear filling the room as they have the Last Supper. Jesus has just told his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. And now they're all freaking out. There's fear and uncertainty about the future. And you can feel that the panic start to rise. This is really happening. And Jesus, sensing the mood, takes his disciples outside from the Last Supper into a garden. It's beautiful, it's crisp, cool air of the night. The moonlight's shining, they're walking down rows of vineyards. And in the midst of this night, which should have been filled with so much panic and despair, there's this strange moment of peace. And Jesus stoops down, smiles with his disciples, calls them to come over, and he picks up the vine of a vineyard. You can imagine the big fruit on the end, the grapes, beautiful and flourishing. And he says to his disciples, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be leaving you. I'm not going to be physically on earth anymore. But this is what our relationship is going to be like. You're going to be a branch and I'm going to be the vine. 
And even though I'm not physically with you, we are going to be intimately connected. That my life will flow into you, my, my source, my energy, and you're going to flourish because of it. We're going to have intimate connection and communion with each other. What a beautiful picture that Jesus leaves his disciples with in the midst of a world that is filled with panic and fear. That you and I, Jesus says, we're going to be friends. Not just going to call you servants, he goes on to say, but you and I are actually going to have a relationship that can be defined by the word friendship. How beautiful is that, that Jesus invites us into communion and union with himself to be friends with Jesus. It's the most wonderful invitation. You know, one of the things Jesus says there is that apart from me, you can do nothing. And actually, that just does not make a lot of sense because we can do a lot of things without Jesus. You ever tried building a business without Jesus? You tried raising a family without Jesus, you try doing all these things without Jesus, like it is possible to live physical life without Jesus. This is obviously fake news. What Jesus is saying is the problem is not that we can't live a physical life without Jesus. The problem is that we, if we're disconnected from the vine, we're gonna be experiencing a spiritual withering from Christ. The more disconnected we are from Christ, we're actually not living our best. We're gonna be experiencing disconnection and withering as a result of that. You know, last week I bought Emma, my wife, some flowers. It was a terrible week in the Burden family. Uh, We all got COVID. We were locked inside for a long period of time. And, you know, it was just time that I did something to, to win back the beautiful mood in the room. So I did the husband thing and I went to get some beautiful tulips. And I don't know where these tulips came from, Holland or somewhere, but they were imported and they were beautiful. You can see this huge bunch of flowers. Many of them haven't even budded. So the first couple of days when I gave these flowers to Em, every morning we'd wake up and the house would be filled with the smell of these beautiful flowers. And Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, these things are still budding and blooming. It's just awesome. If we were just to take a snapshot in that second, it would be tempting to think that these flowers don't need their mother bush in Holland. But you know, they're absolutely fine on their own. They're doing good, they're still blooming, they're flourishing. We, we would be under the illusion that these flowers don't need to be connected. You know, but a couple of days later, the water starts to stink. We're frantically changing the water, trying to keep these things alive. Then the stems begin to wilt and go green. We're chopping them down, trying to make them survive. But eventually, the petals begin to drop and the withering starts to show. You know, you can look pretty good disconnected for a while. They can, they can survive on their own, but eventually the withering does begin to show. And I wonder in your walk with God, if it's okay for a while, things on the outside look good, but can you feel eventually that withering has began to show? That underneath the surface, the energy and the life that you should be living from is not there, that if you pull back the layers, there's a life that is depleted, slightly fractured, craving energy and life source. Maybe on the outside, things are looking pretty good and world's going okay, families seems to be doing well, but on the inside, you just know that your soul and your spirit is missing something. And can I make this suggestion? It's because you and me were never supposed to live alone. We were never supposed to be disconnected from a life source that's bigger than ourselves. We were actually designed to live best when we are in intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, vine to branches, being connected into him in beautiful friendship. That's how you and I were supposed to live. You know, Anthony Hakima writes this. He says that man is bound to God like a fish is bound to water. I love that thought, that the moment that we are removed like fish from the ocean, from God's love and God's presence, we begin to suffocate. Our life begins to crave and thirst for the presence of God again. Even if we don't quite know it, we're craving something beyond ourselves. You know, go back to the Garden of Eden. This is how man and God lived. That Adam would walk with God in the cool of the day. There'd be beautiful fellowship and friendship between him and God. And that's how we're supposed to live. But the moment that sin came in the story, the moment that Adam disobeyed God, they were cut off from intimate connection with him. And ever since, mankind has been feeling the fallout of that intimacy with God. But I want to call us back today, back to the vine branch to vine because you're at your best when you're in intimate connection and friendship with Jesus. So if that's the truth, if we're at our best when we're deeply connected to Christ, vine to branch, his life flowing through us, 
how come so many of us don't live in that place? How come for so many of us Christianity is nothing more than Sunday services, maybe an occasional prayer? You know, it's like winding down the window asking God for directions when we get lost, but apart from that independence, how come our Christianity is not filled with intimacy and friendship like it should be? Well, I think one of the reasons could be that we misunderstand who Jesus is and what he came to bring to us. If we go out onto the street today and we ask a bunch of random people, what was Jesus about? What was, what was his life about? What was his ministry about? What did he come to bring? You might hear this answer a lot. He's here to bring forgiveness of sins. And that is a great answer, by the way, that Jesus did come to bring forgiveness of sins. And it's right that we start here because without our sin being forgiven, we have no chance of entering into a relationship with God. You know, Paul in the New Testament, in the book of Ephesians, he's, he tells us that our sin doesn't just make us bad, but our sin makes us dead. He says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2. And so that deadness that we have makes it impossible for us to have life in Christ. That's the deadness that Adam and Eve experienced when they turned away from God in disobedience. Sin doesn't make us just bad, it makes us dead. And we need a rescuing from that deadness. That's why Christ came and died in our place to, by the shedding of his blood and by our repentance and faith in his death, we can have forgiveness of sin, that that sin in our life can be blotted out, it can be removed. We can have a brand new clean slate and start afresh and reset in life. And that is an awesome thing. Where would I be without God forgiving my sin? It's beautiful. But most Christians stop there. For them, Christianity, once their sins forgiven, is done. It's like the death of Jesus accomplished it. Why do we need to go on any further? That for a lot of Christians, our experience, let's be honest, that's where it finishes. We go on living independent lives, and we come back to God when we need a little bit more forgiveness, and then once we've got the top of forgiveness, we go off and live our independent lives all over again. I did this for many, many years. The image is, is less of a vine and branch grafted together. It's more like a, a little vine that keeps walking away, coming back occasionally just for a little bit more input, but then walking and living independently from God again. I think that a lot of us miss the point that forgiveness, of course, Jesus came to bring that. But forgiveness was not his purpose. Forgiveness was the means to something else. Forgiveness was necessary, but Jesus didn't just come to bring forgiveness. He came to have forgiveness so that we could step into something else, something else better. What is that next thing that Jesus came to really invite us into? John 3.16, many of you will know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is trying to take us out of the deadness of sin into abundant life, into eternal life, life that is more. We know this, but I want you to catch what Jesus said about this eternal life in the garden. This is the one time he seems to really describe what this eternal life is. In John 17 verse 3, he says, now this is eternal life, what I've come to bring you, that they may know God. They may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. So what's Jesus' definition of eternal life? It's not just living forever. It's not just an unending existence, which most of us, to be honest, we don't care too much for, more of the same of what we've already got. No, it's something higher, it's something better. Jesus' definition of eternal life is that we know him. We know the Father and that we know Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? For Jesus, eternal life is not just skipping death and having an unending existence. For Jesus, eternal life is about being united in unending union and relationship with God. It's bizarre, it's amazing. Now that word no, you know, we used to snigger about this word no when we were kids in church because it's the same word, Adam knew his wife Eve. It, it means that Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve. It's talking about the most intimate, vulnerable, beautiful relationship that you can find on the world. And read between the lines, you see what Jesus is trying to invite us into here. That there is a union with God that is so deep and beautiful that we were designed for, that not even the most intimate 
and satisfying relationship on earth can even come close to comparing with. Wow, that eternal life for you and me, which is the purpose of Jesus, is about knowing God. And it's about knowing Jesus. It's about being an intimate connection, being invited to share in the community of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We should not miss and should not skip over the best part of salvation. Yes, Jesus came to forgive us, but the best part is that we get to be with God. So is Jesus about forgiveness? Absolutely. And if it wasn't for forgiveness, we wouldn't be here today. But Jesus is about something far more than simply forgiveness. He's about friendship. Jesus is inviting us into a life with him, to abide with him. His ultimate goal for us and for you and for me is friendship. The beautiful prize of salvation is not just getting into heaven, avoiding hell. It's so much more compelling than that. The beautiful prize which Christ died for you and me to have is unending, abundant friendship with himself that can not only start when we die, but it can start here and now today. What a beautiful invitation. I think, church, that we need to rediscover how captivating and how beautiful this invitation from Jesus is. It's the one thing that can move us over that line from being mere Christians in a crowd on a Sunday to being lovers of God, disciples of Jesus Christ. If we could understand what he's inviting us into. You know, friendship with God's more than just earthly friendship. You know, we're not talking here about you and Jesus sat down on the couch, watching movies together, you know, drinking some Pepsi, he's braiding your hair and you're telling him how to loot the world. I got some advice for you, buddy. Like we need something better than just earthly friendships. This is bigger, this is more beautiful. Imagine the mystery of this, that God, creator of heaven and earth, the one who was never created, who's here yesterday, today and forever, the unending life source of all things. We can walk with him. We can talk with him. We can be with him. Friendship for Jesus is not so much us just being on the same level, hanging out. No, it's, it's that Jesus is promising he's going to hold nothing back from us, which is good for us. He's going to share everything he has with us. He's going to call us friends. We're going to obediently follow him, but in a way that's not slavish, but we can follow him as up close, personal students, apprentices, companions of Jesus Christ. What an honor. That is. And you know, I just step back and I think, wow, I need this so much in my life. Even as a pastor, following God, serving people, pouring out my heart, it can be tempting in all of the mess and the busyness of life to miss what Jesus' invitation is. He's calling me into union and friendship with God. He's calling you out of all of the clutter of what it means to be living on the earth today into friendship, the most beautiful thing to have a friendship and a relationship with God. This is not just about avoiding withering, which of course you know, is what we want to avoid. This is a bad thing, but this is also about not missing out on the most beautiful invitation that mankind has ever received. Friendship with God. Wow, is, is there anyone else today in church who just says, I want this. This is what we were made for, to restore back intimacy together with God. Look, if you want that too, I'm going to give you one really practical way to do it. And you know, over this series between now and Easter, we're going to be talking about uh, nine different practical ways that we can actually start to have intimate friendship, discipleship, following God. And we're going to get to a whole load of things about becoming like Jesus, ending on doing what he did. And it's going to be amazing, but I want to start with something today which might surprise you. I want you to go back and look at Jesus' words in verse 7. He said that if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And my words remain in you. Jesus is inviting us here in the context of talking about us being vines and branches deeply connected into him, that his words are gonna be one of the keys to helping us to abide in friendship with God. His word, you know, this word here, the scripture that we talk about, it describes itself as 2 Timothy 3.16, God breathed. 
the words are not just ink on pages, that it actually has the life of God inside it. Hebrews 4.12 describes it as the word of God, which is living and active. So even though this dusty old ragged Bible kind of looks a bit torn up and dead, but this thing, when I open its pages and I, I read it and I dwell in it, this is the life of God flowing into me, just like that vine flowing into the branches and bringing the fruitfulness, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. There's, there's something about this word that comes alive when we read it. It's beautiful. When I first moved to Malaysia, you know, um, I couldn't quite immerse and connect with Malaysia for a number of months because I just didn't quite understand the culture. It was alien to me. I didn't understand why people double parked. I didn't understand why people loved spicy food so much. I didn't understand all the phrases that people used to describe life. Couldn't understand why people walk so slowly. <laughs> but eventually as I spent time here, spent time with friends, I started to listen to the words, the language, I immersed myself in the culture. Eventually I started to pick up the culture of Malaysia. I started to be able to relate to it more, depend on it more. And my life came more integrated with Malaysia as a result, all because the words of Malaysia, the culture of Malaysia start to become familiar to me. Now with God, we are alien to his culture. That we, after that disobedience in the garden, we have a sinful nature in us that is so alien to God. It's like an ant approaching a magnificent beast. Like there is no way that our natures can be united. That's what Christ did when he forgave us and it made it possible for us to have relationship. But our natures are still so different. What the word of God does is it comes to live within us, the truth of God, to dwell in us and actually transform us by the renewing of our mind from the inside out. His truth gets into us deeply. And as we begin to understand God's heart, God's ways, God's law, uh, as we begin to lay down our view and our opinions about what is right and wrong in the world and how things should be, but we take on God, we submit to his ways of right and wrong, the creator's way that he designed the world. We start to be able to relate to him on an even bigger level. It's beautiful when we get the word of God on the inside of us, we can relate to God much deeper. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. When his words remain in us, when his words abide in us, and then we can ask whatever we wish and it will be done. Why? Because we're in agreement. My prayers are not all self-seeking, but actually my prayers line up to God because I've got his word dwelling in my heart. You know, many people are still struggling to read the Bible in our church too. And you know, it's said that around the world, average Christian has nine Bibles and is looking for even more. Why is that? Why are we struggling? I think it's because we live in an information age where we're reading scripture to try and get more and more information. But the Bible should be something deeper. It's living and active. And it's awesome that we're reading the Bible to understand the big picture and taking Bible courses and understanding that. But I don't want you to turn into the kind of person who can read the Bible from cover to cover every year and never be changed by it. I want us to be able to submit our whole life to the Word of God, that when we come around sacred scripture, we understand that this is being with God. His words are dwelling in our heart. Let me give you just one practical way before we finish to read the Bible. I love cooking at home. And you know, sometimes an onion, I'll take it and I'll stir fry an onion. It's amazing when you stir fry an onion because you get the sweetness, you get the crispness. It tastes like an onion, but it's high heat. It's intense. You can get it on the plate within a couple of minutes. But there's also another way to cook an onion, which is to very slowly simmer it. I don't know all my cooking friends out there if you've ever tried this, but cut the onion down thinly on the lowest heat, maybe just a tiny bit of butter, just to allow the flavors of the onion to emerge. You'll be amazed after 45 minutes of letting an onion simmer at the tiniest heat, just ticking over, the sweetness of the flavors of the onion come pouring out. You compare these two dishes, a stir fried onion next to a caramelized sweet onion, they are totally different. See, one of them is almost like the onion in its natural state, but when you simmer it, it brings something out that you never even knew was there. And when we read the Word of God, I want us to start to simmer in the Word of God. I've been doing it this week with um, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, not on things below. For you died, 
and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. That scripture's just been simmering around my mind every day and I can't get it into my head straight away. I need to simmer it and think on it. And every day I'll go back and add another verse and I'll just simmer on it. And it can catch you in the middle of the day. You're just heading out to get some groceries. You're just in the car. Let bring back that scripture to mind. Just let it simmer in my heart and mind. And the, the, the flavor, the life, the revelation of the word of God begins to burst out. Why don't you try it this week? Take one chapter. Colossians 3 is a great starting place. Ephesians 1 is another good starting point. Just let it simmer all the way through the week. Each morning, spend some time. God, here's my 45 minutes. Here's an hour with you, and I'm going to give you this time. I'm going to let the word of God simmer in my heart. Look, I know so many of us here today are craving not just to follow God from a distance, but we want intimate connection with God. And can I encourage you, the word of God is your starting point simmering in the word of God this week will help you. So let me challenge you for these next seven days until we meet again next Sunday, dive into the word of God and simmer in this all the way through the week. If you're here today and you're just saying, I want it, I want vine branch connection. I don't just want forgiveness of sins, but I want friendship. Can I pray for you as we end this service? I'm just gonna ask now that the Holy Spirit helps to usher in this intimacy and this connection with God brings a revelation to your heart and that this week would look completely different. That as we meet here again next week, you're gonna feel changed. You're gonna feel transformed because of your time of walking with God, how you were always intended to. So Holy Spirit, I pray for every person who's listening to this message today. I thank you for them. Thank you for their desire to be disciples, to not just be attenders of services, but to be disciples who intimately want to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that this week, you'd help them to overcome all of the disconnection that they felt in their relationship with you. I pray you'd help them to move beyond forgiveness. Help them to see that forgiveness is the starting point. Repentance is where it all begins. But then you want them to move forward into an abundant life of you, an abundant life of transformation and being changed in the, into the image of Jesus. So God, bless them today. Bless them as they watch this. Father, I pray you'd draw near. And Lord, I pray that you'd show them now that your presence surrounds every person who's watching this. In fact, for a moment, come on, everyone who's watching this, why don't you just reach out your hands before you and just realize that God is around you. He's in you. He's closer to you than the air that you breathe. Take a moment just to breathe in God's presence. Father, we recognize that you're all around us. You're with us, that you want to be with us. And we pray that this week would be marked by disciples being with their master, learning from their rabbi, their teacher, their Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that this would result in deep transformation in our hearts. Let your words dwell in us richly. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Can't wait to continue this series with you next Sunday. Uh, we'll see you back here again. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in today. Now, if that message really spoke to you, can I encourage you to like and to share this out with friends or people that you know, this would really speak to them. Now, on that note, um, also, you can catch up on any of our discipleship series that you might have missed from our previous weeks. You can just head over to our YouTube channel and you would be able to find it there. For now, we are going to sign off and I'll see you again same time, same place next week.